disguise that is currently fucked up and we are gonna try to rebuild Dave Tate. You know, over the years, trashing the body, doing world-class things under the bar, it takes its toll. Dave's dealing with some big orthopedic issues and after going through some of his medical history, some of his training history, and his current training status, we have some work to do. That's why I'm here at the Elite FTS headquarters and we're gonna be spending an entire day assessing, evaluating, and getting a game plan to move Dave Tate forward. All right, so what we're gonna break down now, we got you through subjective history. We went through and we got some movement screening on you. We got some really good data from that movement screen. But remember, the difference between a screen and an assessment is a screen is to identify red flags. We got red flag, we got red flags, we got red flags on motor control. It's not good enough to identify the red flags clinical basis, we need to test those, we need to assess them, and we need to come up with two things. Medical diagnosis based on your current conditions, but also a functional movement capacity diagnosis, meaning how are you moving, how are we going to get you to move better? So really this starts off with a top-down approach. So we're going to look at some global movements, very similar to what we did with the FMS, but we're going to look at it with a little bit more nitpicky eye, a clinical eye, and really assessing two different things. Pain provocation, so it's going to be painful or non-painful, but we're also going to look at a functional movement pattern, which I'll look at, or something that is deemed dysfunctional. And from there, we're going to simplify down these global movement patterns to isolate out a key area that we're really going to look to improve. It works. So we're going to start off, I usually start everybody out trying to assess something with the spine. For any coach, if you're ever in doubt, look at the spine first. Mm -hmm. Like That's like rule number one. The spine integrates with so many different things, it's really the key player in almost anything, whether it be movement, whether it be the gym, whether it be activities of daily living. So what we're gonna look at is really the pillar complex looking all together into spinal flexion, spinal extension. So we know we're dealing with some capacity up to get into mm -hmm. the overhead position, but we're gonna really just key in on uh, the spinal positions. We're gonna start out with a forward flex based position. So we're gonna put you with your feet together again, we're gonna lock out the knees, we're gonna go hand over hand here, and you're gonna come down, you're gonna use everything to flex, and then you're gonna come back up. And if you could face this way, I'll look from yeah. the side. How here. much knee lock out? I want it fully locked out, so right. I want the movement only happening from the hips. So what I'm looking at here, come back up. So pause for about a second at the bottom, and then come back up into a neutral position. This isn't just about hamstring flexibility here with the toe touch test. It's not about just pass or fail, whether your hands touch down to the toes or not. What we're looking at here is spinal curvature. We want about equal distribution on all of these segments of the spine, C-spine, T-spine, L-spine, all moving into flexion when you go down, all moving into extension when you go back. More importantly, from a movement quality standpoint, we look at posterior hip shift to unlock the mechanism that allows us to move with good spinal positions. So we're also looking at the hip shooting back here. So let's go hand over hand again. We're gonna touch down and then come back up. My fingers up or down, don't matter. Fingers are gonna go straight down over right. the ground. Come back up. So right away, we note that, yeah, you're moving pretty good in the flexion here. You're moving the neck into flexion here, but we're really just uh, having a pretty flat back here that's really not getting into any flexion-based moment. And really the posterior hip translation is a little bit um, less to a degree that we'd want it at. Let's go down one more time. We're going to point out one more thing here and come back up. The last thing that we're looking at here is the ability of the pelvis to unlock and to rotate. So basically we, we call this, we deem this uh, pelvic hip rhythm. So as you come down into flexion, the lumbopelvic rhythm will bring your pelvis to posteriorly tilt, like dump your pelvis backside, and then it'll finish off the movement by anteriorly tilting. And by tilting the pelvis in different degrees, this stuff should happen naturally. It's something that unlocks the ability to move authentically at the lumbar spine here. Let's look at this one more time. So out of all three of those things, what we really see is um, a pretty locked in neutral spinal position that doesn't get into flexion at the lower back. Posterior hip translation isn't to a level that we'd really want to see it, probably because this is playing in as well. But the number one factor is that just looking at your greater trochanter and up on your iliac crest here, 
there is zero movement here happening at the pelvis. The pelvis is just like fucking locked into the point where you have co-contractions happening from anterior chain, posterior chain, lateral chain, medial chain. Everything's in protection mode. And that's one of the, the biggest limiting factors when you think about the most intermediary joints of the body, the pelvis, the hip, the lumbar spine. You know, that's something that we're going to look at first. Can that be a replacement thing? <laughs> no, because... Um, when they do the replacements, they only replace a portion of the pelvis yes. that comes in contact with the prosthetic head. Yeah. So the pelvis is two different pieces. So you look at the, the pelvis, uh, the pubic symphysis on the front side, and you look at the SI joints on the back side with the coccyx here. We should have slight degrees, I'm talking about millimeter degrees of rotation that happen driven by muscular tension. Yeah. But if we have co-contractions happening, no micro movements happen and it really restricts our ability to move asymmetrically gotcha. so we're going to look at asymmetrical stance here in exactly that same way and see if it alters the way that you're able to use your pelvis so you're going to go left foot forward you can go right foot back we're really putting the majority of the weight over on this left side and you're going to do the same thing touching down here knees locked knee is going to remain locked on that left side yeah good come back Go up on your toe so this doesn't have any tension in it. Yeah, just like that. Good, come back up. So you can see here, we start to get a little bit of lumbar flexion to happen. Go one more time. Posterior hip translation much better. And there's a tiny bit of rotation starting to happen there. So the body, it thrives in asymmetrical stance. Bilateral function, is not natural to the human instinct. It's not natural to the developmental sequence. It's something that is earned over time. So usually when we try to reprogram, repattern people, it usually starts in asymmetrical stance because that's how we inherently gain more stability. Let's look at this right side and see how it compares to the left. Make sure that right knee stays locked in. You're up on the toes on that left side. Again, you can see much better of a flexion moment here. You can see the actual range of motion, the objective measure is getting better. And go one more time here. Hips shoot back a little bit better. And we really just unlock a lot of quality of movement there. How did it feel compared to when you had both feet? Oh, it feels way better. Feels way better? Yeah. So, I mean, subjectively, that's something that we need to take into account when we're screening this shit. It's like one of the things that stuck out in my mind, I've repeated it a couple times now, but the lack of uh, asymmetrical stance loading in your program, that was like a ding, 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 red flag yeah. thing to me because really I, I view that single leg, it's an orthopedic indicator lift. It's not like, hey, I'm gonna see how much I can load up on my one RM on a mm -hmm. Bulgarian split squat. I don't give a shit about that. I give a shit if you can move through a single leg movement pattern, mm -hmm. whatever one that we deem that we're gonna be working on and we can maintain that. Mm -hmm. For our power lifters, usually that happens in the dynamic warm-up or it happens in our accessory lifts. And sometimes it even happens on just off-day recovery. Yeah. It's uh, low joint stress and it's high neurologically in terms of stabilization. So it's a high yielding factor that's really low stress on the body in terms of like a neurological frying component or even like breaking down the body from a mechanical standpoint. Yeah. So from here, Really the next thing to do is to get you on the table and we're going to take motor control out of the equation here. So motor control is something that when we think about it, it's you standing your body upright against gravity. That's mm -hmm. as simply as I can define it. But basically there's a lot of different things happening from your brain down into your spinal cord, your central and your peripheral nervous system all to coordinate together up against gravity. The quality of your movement is really your motor control. But when we get you down in a more passive position, we're gonna be laying on your back here. Mm -hmm. That's gonna show us a motor control independent position. So it's gonna actually show the joints, the soft tissues, the way that they're able to move without the apprehension and the restriction of the motor control. All right, so we got you laying down supine on the back. Really the reason that we're doing this is again to take motor control out of the equation. We're gonna look at the way that you're moving. We're gonna go through that active straight leg raise again. But the big difference here is we're gonna compare your passive active straight leg raise versus your active straight leg raise. So I want you to go feet together. I want you to come up slow and controlled with this side and come back down. I'm gonna do that one more time and then once you get up there, just try to relax and I'm gonna take you through a passive range of motion. Okay, and relax everything. So you can see that we have more range. I'm not really cranking on Dave at all here. 
but even going up that high, we got an additional 25, 30 degrees. Let's look at this side and we'll talk a little bit more about why this passive versus active is really important. Boom, come back down. Let's go up again. Again, as I'm doing this, I'm not just cranking this pelvis into rotation. I'm looking at this leg, making sure that it's not compensating. And you can see this right side, man. We're getting some really great mobility here. I know this feels like shit, but right. this has the ability to show us one important thing. It's called the motor control gap. Motor control gap is the passive range of motion minus the active. That range of motion, if it's more than about 10%, that predisposes us to some injuries up chain, some injuries down chain, and just uh, resilience in general. So really, we had a, maybe a 20 or 30 degree discrepancy in that motor control gap there when we did active straight leg, active minus passive. It's probably even more than that, but I didn't crank you into these, these positions uh, just because it feels like yeah. shit. But that's the kind of thing that we wanna identify because when we have compensation patterns that hit, especially when this active straight leg raise correlates with our hip hinge based movements, that's the sort of thing that we need to strengthen the back side of the body. We need to add stability. We need to add functional strength back there. I hate the word functional strength, but that's what we're really looking at in order to control some of these moments to open up this gap and be able to utilize it a bit better. So anytime that we have somebody in this position, uh, after we go through the active straight leg raise, really the next key is just to get an idea of how your hips are moving. We're gonna go through just some range of motion, some passive, I'll look at a little bit of active here, knowing very well we have prosthetics in both sides, just making sure that we stay within those contraindications. So guys, make sure that if you are working with somebody that has a past surgical history, has a past medical history, has hip replacements, you know what the fuck you're doing before you go and start cranking people's hips in and out. Anytime that you're directing range of motion, that's well within your scopes of practice for a coach, what we don't want to be doing is manipulating positions, forcing people into positions. As soon as you try to manipulate somebody's position, that's no good. So lead them through because this is well within a coach's scope of practice to do so and look at some of these ranges of motion. So the first one we're looking at is I'm just going to have you bring up your knee towards your chest. You're going to kind of keep stable with this opposite side. And I'm just going to look at this from a passive standpoint. Again, I'm going to bring you down into this range of motion looking at some of the adductor plus hamstring, and then the glute in this range of motion here. From a 90-90 degree position, we're just looking through external, internal. All these are looking really good, and they should look really good because we have metal on a piece of plastic in there, <laughs> and they should be pretty money. It's important to note though, everyone's gonna have a different hip structure. Hip structure determines the way that you're able to squat, the way that you're able to deadlift, run, do mechanics that are authentic to you. So looking at hip structure, that's really the way that we try to rebuild some people's squat and deadlift patterns to be able to play into their strengths instead of fighting their weaknesses through their anthropometrical structure. Let's look at this other hip here. So you're going to kind of bring this hip up into your chest. And again, this is good hip flexion here. This is money. We look at external rotation again. I'm okay with that. But the biggest thing here is not a lack of mobility. But as we're rotating, as we're doing some of these positions, the pelvis is going nuts, the core is compensating, uh, everything is falling into compensation pattern. This is interesting because it looks like you have really good mobility when you're down on this table. Mm -hmm. Did you feel like you had good mobility when you were standing up? No. But there's a big difference between mobility and stability deficits. We were talking about it off camera yeah. here that sometimes we need more stability to take down that apprehension to display the mobility that we naturally have. When we're thinking about the hips and more so the shoulders, these are the two most inherently mobile joints in the body, ball and socket based joints. Most people aren't in need of more mobility here. Yeah. They're in need of stabilizing this and the pelvis and linking these things up so they can just work properly. So from this position, I just wanna look at two more it's called an F-A-B-E-R position. And this really shows external rotation, some abduction. Good. And then I'm just going to take Dave out into true abduction at the hip, which is out against midline. Good. 
So again, I want to repeat this, like Dave on the table, this mobility is looking good from the front side of the body and the back side of the body. I'm going to have you flip over and we're going to go down on your stomach here and we're going to look at some of the rotation and then we're also going to look at hip extension here. So when you're looking at ranges of motion, it's important to look at different levels of flexion based moments at the hip, especially for internal and external. You have muscles on the back side of the body here. The piriformis is like the notorious one that everyone has tr problems with, so to say. Uh, but you have a deep six rotator group here. They're both internal and external rotators of the hip depending on the hip's position. So for things like squatting, running, single leg stance, this is really important stuff to, to know because all ro rotation is not created equal. So basically from a hip neutral position here, I'm just gonna have this stabilizing Dave's pelvis coming into external rotation. Cool, that looks good. Look at this internal rotation. Again, he has it. But do you see this stuff happening right here? He comes over with it. So he has more than enough here. But again, that heavy compensation pattern, probably from guarding after surgery, uh, guarding from years in pain, that stuff is things that we want to start to rewire. If we're compensating down on your stomach on a table while I'm just bringing you through passive ranges of motion, imagine what we're doing under a couple hundred pounds. So let's look at this opposite hip here in terms of rotation. So we're going to look at external. Hey. And again, you can see this huge body shift. Even when I stabilize, it just wants to bring it over, just a protection mechanism here. The last one that we're gonna do here is bring Dave's knee into 90 and then ask him to push his heel up towards the ceiling. Good, bring it back down. I'm gonna stabilize here, push up again, and then relax it. This hip extension is actually pretty good. Again, breaking neutral, getting into about 20, 30 degrees is where we want to be. But again, we're looking at bilateral push up, come back down, push up, and then relax. So in a million years, going through that FMS and then translating it into what you currently have in terms of your joint capacity, your motor control and your soft tissue capacity here at the hips, these things are looking good. So what I want to do is transition this into an extended base position up and standing. We're going to go through that same kind of sequence here. All right, cool. So the next one that we're going to move into is multi-segmental extension. So we're going to get the spine, the hips all moving into an extended base moment. We know we're dealing with some uh, issues, some limitations here at the right shoulder. So I want you to do your best to get into this extended base position and then come back down. So Again, don't fight spine, into not pain. The shoulder. We're looking at everything inclusively, knowing very well that there's some shit going gotcha. on over there. So let's face it this way, and you're gonna go feet together again, and really we're gonna bring everything that we have into extension, and then you can come back into neutral. Good, and coming back out. Let's do that one again. Good. So we're looking at the same quality and quantity components as we were with the flexion. So we want the lumbopelvic rhythm to be on point. We want extension throughout the spine to be on point. We also don't want any shifting happening and the quality of the motion actually being there. So the first couple of reps here, obviously we see that the, the arms restriction coming into that extension moment, but also the mid back here, truly restricted in terms of not being able to extend. Mm -hmm. Your flexion moment was money but most likely we've been living in flexion for a long, long yeah. time there. Uh, just from your daily activities too, it's not always about your sport background, it's about the last couple of years, the last decade, two decades, a lot of computer work, a lot mm -hmm. of writing, driving. Yeah. That's stuff that even pro athletes deal with. NBA players, they get on a plane every other day to go travel. Mm -hmm. They're all sitting there. Everyone's on their phones, everyone's on their computers. So this isn't just like a sport issue. This mm -hmm. is a life issue that 95 plus percent of people deal with. So let's go through one more time. We're gonna look at this pelvis here. So let's extend back. So whereas Dave's pelvis didn't posteriorly translate on the last one, you can come back into the neutral. We can see that it does translate anteriorly towards the forward when he does come into that extension moment. So we have a really good rotation happening here. The only problem is that it doesn't happen in the opposite direction and maybe we're stuck into a little bit of this uh, co-contracted base position at the pelvis that's restricting our back. For many athletes, I see the kind of presentation that you're currently in. So it's slightly anteriorly tilted, 
you're kind of stuck in an anterior pelvic tilt. You're stuck in a little bit of an extension moment through a fulcrum at the lower part of the spine. A fulcrum is a, a segment to two segments where much of the mov movement happens from. Huge fulcrum that's happening here as you extend, but also I think you're not getting full translation of the hips even though the hips are moving forward. They're coming more from a compensation happening at the back as opposed to the hips unlocking the back in the process. So really the big things to focus on here while we're up in the standing position, inability to get into extension here, inability to get out of that uh, anterior pelvic position here. And again, the big thing that I really wanna focus in here on is this fulcruming point into extension at the lumbar spine. Because that's something that anytime that we have pain that's happening at the lower extremities, it is negligent not to look at the spine first, rule it out, and then go into the extremity, whether it's the hip, the knee, the foot, whatever yeah. it is, because there's so many intertwinings between these two spots. So similar to what we just did with the flexion-based position, we're gonna get you into a more passive position, and we're gonna start here on your stomach. All right, so we got you down in this position. Uh, we are gonna get up into a prone press-up. So you're gonna have your hands right onto your armpits, and you're gonna press yourself up coming into extension here. Good, and controlling yourself back down. I want you to extend everything that you have so you can extend your neck with this motion as well. Good. One more time, come back down. Can I lower my hands more? Uh, yeah, a little bit. So what I'm looking at here, can you stay in this for a second, yeah. is this range of motion gap right here. Come back down. So when we go into extension, especially in this passive base position, we're looking at a couple key things. Yes, the spine moving into extension, spine moving into extension, anterior pelvic tilt, but also the ability of the hip flexors, the deep hip flexors, the superficial hip flexors to have the mobility to be able to keep the front side of the pelvis here, uh, bony prominence is called the ASIS, within about two to three inches to the table. So you can see as it, when Dave presses up, his pelvis comes right up off there because of some tightness on the front side of the body there. Uh, I say tightness relatively, maybe it's just a motor control thing, maybe it's actual uh, tissue tightness, but that's what we're gonna differentiate right now. Because anytime we see a presentation like that, it's not good enough to say, hey, Dave, your hip flexors suck. We need to know which hip flexors it is, and we need to know whether it's a, a mechanical thing, whether we need to mobilize the tissues, or whether it's a neurological thing, we just need to have you moving a little bit better. So we're gonna flip over on your back again, and you're gonna scoot your butt all the way down. All right, so we have Dave flipped around. He has his tailbone on the edge of the pad here. And what we wanna do is be able to differentiate between deep hip flexor mobility issues or superficial hip flexor mobility issues. So the quadriceps, the rectus femoris, that's the one we're really looking at, as opposed to the deep iliopsoas group, which is the deeper hip flexor of this hip flexor group. So we're gonna put Dave into this uh, very standard position. It's one that's been used for 30 or 40 years in orthopedic-based testing. It's called the Thomas test position. We're gonna position Dave with his tailbone on the edge of the table. We're gonna have you bring your knee up towards your chest, and you're gonna kinda of hold it in with your arms if you can. And we're gonna watch what happens over here. This is our key focus here. You know, this box is a little bit low, but we can see what we need to see here. So we're biasing deep hip flexors versus superficial hip flexors. Basically what we wanna look at is the ability of the knee to move down and go past neutral line of the hip but also to see if there's any rotation happening here. But I'm gonna straighten out Dave's knee. You okay here? Mm -hmm. And then I'm gonna bring him down into hip extension, biasing the psoas group here. So you can see that Dave has pretty good mobility when it comes to here, but the front side of the quadriceps, rectus femoris, that's really the one that we're working on. So let's look at the opposite side here. Let's bring this knee up, good. Same thing here. And same thing here. Good, relax for a second. So this is interesting, right? So where's that pain that comes into your quad in the winter? Right there, right? Yeah. So we said your, your iliopsoas group, that thing's probably strong as shit from mm -hmm. bracing over the years. That's probably not the issue here. Mm -hmm. Rectus fem, that thing's holding on for dear life and it's painful and mm -hmm. it's symptomatic. Guess what we're working on? Yeah. Okay, let's, um, let's go on your side here. So you're gonna lay like in a fetal position. You're gonna be facing this way and you can be hip over hip, shoulder over shoulder. 
This next standard position that really everybody should be looking at is called the Ober's test position. So let's get you like fetal position. You can go knee over knee. Boom, you okay like that? Yeah. So this position is used to look at this lateral hip group in conjunction with the hip flexors. So we just saw that uh, left hip flexor, rectus fem, that's something that we want to be able to address in terms of a mechanical uh, standpoint, but we also want to be able to look at it with the lateral hip group. Lateral hip group is really, really important because we have gluteus maximus, but then we have the two underlying muscles of the gluteus minimus and then the gluteus medius. And then these two come in conjunction with something called the tensor fascia lata, which is the musculature that attaches down here to the IT band that really restricts some adduction moment. So we're gonna bring Dave here into extension at the hip, and we're gonna look at the ability to extend first. Cool, we already know he has good extension. We had him down in the prone position, we extended about 25 degrees. But what I wanna look at is full excursion into extension plus adduction, and it's like, you don't wanna go there. There's no friggin' way, right? Everything is just, <laughs> everything's lighting up here. You can feel the muscular tightness through TFL. You can feel the lateral hip group just turn on and protect that moment. We're not gonna crank Dave into this position because this is one of those contraindicated positions, but for a standard test, you get them into hip extension, and they should have the ability to touch their knee down to that level surface that you're testing from. Let's go and flip over so you're gonna be on your, your opposite shoulder. See a little bit better from this side. Starting from the fetal position, we're gonna to bring top hip into extension. We're gonna make sure he extends, which he does. Again, we've already tested. And this is something that, again, everything is turning on in the straight protection mode here, even more so right here. This stuff is just all protecting. But again, to be understandable, anytime that you go in for surgery, it fixes the mechanical issues like we were just talking about. There's the hardware. We got new hardware. Mm -hmm. We're good to go on the hardware. We need to ingrain the software onto the fucking computer so you're able to use the hardware a little bit more effectively. And this is something that I see a lot of. It's just, again, that global tightness. That same thing that we saw with flexion and extension, just restricting the pelvic motion, that might be led from a lot of muscular issues coming through the lateral hip group, coming from the anterior hip group, and even more so from the posterior hip group here globally. So the next thing that we're gonna look at, we got flexion moment, we got extension moment. We've really focused in here on the lower quadrants, the lower body and the spine so far. And we're just gonna finish this off by looking at some rotation. Uh, we know that you're not currently training a whole lot of rotation or anti-rotation components, but we wanna get a metric on how you're globally rotating. And we're gonna do that from a standing position. So we're gonna come up, your feet are gonna be again together. And we're gonna use everything that you got. So you can use your hips, you can use your shoulders, you can use your head, everything that you have, and you're gonna rotate right back towards the logo wall. What I'm looking at here is to get about 100 total degrees, come back in neutral, 100 total degrees from the hips plus the T-spines and the shoulders. So what that means is as Dave rotates this way, if I'm looking forward on him, I should be able to see this back shoulder, which I do not currently see. So in best cases, we're gonna have about 50 degrees coming from the hips, about 50 degrees of rotation happening from the shoulder complex, including the thoracic spine. Let's look at opposite side rotation. Again, this is a little bit more restricted. Anytime that we, come back to neutral, anytime that we look at bilateral stuff, we need to be comparing left to right patterns. That's very, very important. Asymmetries are important, especially somebody doing a lot of bilateral based training. Any asymmetry really becomes um, you know, a forefront issue if we are compensating in yeah. that way. So we see the hips, we've already assessed the hips. I really wanna look more into the thoracic spine. The way that we're gonna do that is have you sit down right on the box here. We're gonna put the hips into a flexion-based position which kinda locks in the lumbar spine, locks in the hips, locks in the pelvis, so we can look at rotation here at the shoulders and at the thoracic spine. So I'm gonna have you hold this dowel just like this on your chest. Perfect, and we're gonna rotate back this way again. Good, come back. Lock in your hips, use your butt, drive your feet down, now rotate. You can see how much more that limited it things. So Dave is a world-class compensator, come back. Wants to compensate every single thing because it's hardwired into the system to do so. It's been trained over decades and decades, which was a good thing, 
until it's a little bit too much and we need to be able to have the ability to not compensate through some of these. So stabilizing here, driving the feet down, squeezing your butt, now rotate this way. You can see we're at about 15 degrees. We want about 50 degrees there. Now, unstabilize all this, rotate again. You can fool you. Good athletes can fool you. Make sure that you're testing what you think you're testing. That is very, very important because if we go, oh fuck, Dave's T-spine rotation's money, that's stuff that we could be doing to get better that we're not doing because we tested like shit. Let's rotate this way, everything locked in, locked in, rotate. Again, a little bit less rotation here going to the left. And what we're looking at with this rotation is the ability to side bend, rotate, and extend at the same time with the thoracic spine and the C-spine working together as a functional unit. Yes, there is, some, um, there is some stuff going on here at the shoulders and the shoulder blades. All this stuff works as a functioning unit. So we're really looking at, hey, can we rotate a little bit more from the T-spine or are we locked in? Is it a muscular issue? Is it a joint issue? Is it a motor control issue? All right, so we'll, uh, we'll get back down on your stomach again. All right, so taking Dave back down into a regress position to test from, we're really worried about the upper quadrant here. So upper quadrant function is the head and the neck. You got the mid back, you got the thoracic cage, which most people forget about, with the shoulder blade, the glenohumeral joint, the shoulder complex in general. We're gonna again look at how it's rotating and extending simultaneously. We got Dave in the quadruped position here, and what we're gonna be looking at is his ability to rotate out unilaterally. So we're gonna start knowing that we have this restriction. Usually our base position to rotate from is fingertips on the back of the head. Dave, I just want you to bring your hand up this way just so we can kind of get it out of the way. And what I want you to think about doing is you're gonna flex elbow to elbow, and then you're gonna bring it up and rotate through as high as you can get. So it's gonna be elbow to elbow, and then rotating up the opposite direction. Good. Come back down. Just as we did the hamstrings, we're gonna go active, come back up, and then we're do, gonna do a passive. You can see that a little bit different there. One more time, and go through. Try to relax. You all right? Yep. Again, we have a lot more capacity there. Good, let's go opposite side here. Flexion remains good. Extension, come back down. And looking at more passive, relax everything. Good. So again, motor control gap. We have some excursion happening here at the T-spine. It's actually able to rotate pretty well. Extension's a little bit more limited, but again, uh, it's becoming a, a recurring thing with many of these testing positions is that everything wants to kick on and start protecting. When you're in pain for a long time, it's, uh, you know, it's no surprise to anyone that you want to protect the painful site. And protecting the painful site usually happens with global tightness, uh, neurological based tightness, almost uh, that parking brake on the car, so to say, and then movement happening from other places where we don't want it. From this thoracic spine rotation position, we want the thoracic spine to rotate. We had a lot of rotation moments happening at that same fulcrum and point that we saw when you're going into that extension on two feet. So again, we're just trying to piece these things together, see what continuously uh, starts to happen over and over and over again. And again, the thoracic spine, the L spine, those are the two issues that through many of these different testing positions that we continue to see the kind of the same compensation patterns hit. But that's exactly what we wanna do. We wanna add all these components together when we start looking at our plan of care. All right, so we got a pretty good idea of flexion, extension, rotation now. I really wanna shift gears and I wanna look more up into the upper quadrant, knowing very well that we have some bone spurs, we have some restrictions, we have some wear and tear at this right shoulder. But anytime that we look at the shoulders, we also need to be looking at the neck because these two things are really fine tuned together. So the three positions that we like to look at from a neck standpoint is flexion, extension, and rotation to the both sides. So sit seated in a good posture here, you're gonna bring your chin down to your chest, get as far as you can go. Really what we're looking at here is making contact with the chin, hitting the sternum here. Dave's not bad here, it's pretty good. Let's come back up. The opposite position, I want you to look up towards the ceiling as far as you can go. You want me, what do you want me to do with my back? I want you, everything neutral except for your neck. 
So the angle that, you can relax it from here, the angle that we look at for here is trying to get within 10 degrees of parallel where the forehead is facing the ceiling. A little bit more restricted there. We're at like 40 degrees, 50 degrees, we want to be at about 80 degrees. Cool, we'll keep that in mind as we go through. We're going to look at keeping everything in neutral again and you're going to rotate on an axis and we're going to go this way. Good, and come back to neutral. Let's do that one one more time. Good. Let's come opposite way, bilaterally looking at it. A little bit better rotation back towards that left, come back to neutral, go left again, and then right side one more time. So restriction into extension so far, restriction into right rotation. We're gonna add a couple more in here. Those are the base three positions that you wanna look at, but when you do see some of these restrictions, we wanna look into some side bending, and then we want some uh, upper cervical flexion as well. So basically, you're gonna bring your ear to your shoulder as far as you can go this way. Again, a little bit more restricted, come back to neutral. Let's go opposite way. Relax the shoulder, come back to neutral. Go this way again. Good, this way. Okay, restriction, side bending towards the right. This stuff's no surprise. surprise. Rotation, Rotation deficit, 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 right, right, side, side bending, bending deficit, deficit, right, 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 right shoulder chronic issues, right upper back tightness issues. The last one I want to look at is you're going to rotate as far as you can go this way and then you're going to bring your neck down and you're going to try to touch your chin right on your clavicle. Good, relax, come back to neutral, rotate, chin down, and again no contact there. Come back, let's rotate opposite way, come down, contact. Cool. So we have a couple different things. This is more on the clinical side of things when we're looking at differentiating uh, joint pain versus muscular pain versus neurological based pain. Anytime that you screen out the neck, it's like we have some low hanging fruit to get the neck working a little bit better. We have a lot of important stuff going through this region that connects down into this region and controls the shoulder and the entire upper extremity. So really there's a, there's a lot to be tested through up into here before we even get into the shoulder. But basically we're looking at spinal rotation deficit right, side bending deficit right, upper cervical flexion deficit towards that right side as well. This is all stuff to keep in mind because we don't want to be testing the shoulder to be looking at the shoulder and being like, holy shit, the shoulder doesn't work when it's never the shoulder's issue in the first place. There's a big difference between shoulder origins and shoulder symptoms. Shoulder origins are very few and far between. This is probably one of them that we're dealing with today that have symptoms that are coming up chain. But usually what happens is they come down chain. We have problems that happen at the thoracic. We have problems that happen at the scap. We have problems that happen at the neck and they go and they manifest themselves usually with that chronic front-sided shoulder pain. And actually in the last 10 years, the data shows that in the active population, shoulder pain is the number one pain complaint, which is crazy because that's above lower back pain. Yeah. It's fucking nuts. <laughs> so we're gonna get you to lay down on your back here. I just wanna go through more of a complete shoulder range of motion assessment. We're gonna go through first active, and then we're gonna go through passive. I'm gonna focus here a lot on Dave's left side first, so then we can compare again going into the right side. So the first one I want you to do is you're gonna be a thumb up position, and you're gonna come up into forward flexion as high as you can get. Just left arm. You can go both at the same time, slow. It's gonna, you're gonna get better. Yep. results if I do one. Actually, I'll compensate better. Yeah, 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 right. Here, bring it back down. So I want everything slow and controlled, yeah. and I want you to elevate with the thumb up position. Good, come back down. That was so interesting that you said that. I'm glad that you said that because now go up with only the left arm. Oh shit, 180, 180 degrees, you're good to go. What's the difference between those two things? Unilateral, versus bilateral. When we go unilateral at the upper extremities, we take out the ability or the necessity to need to stabilize both scaps and the T-spine and the T-cage together. When we get unilateral, we're able to compensate that much more and we open up the mobility mm -hmm. a crazy amount. So let's go bilateral one more time. So this is truly authentic motion here. And then bring this arm down, keep this one up, and then keep that going. So you can easily get another 15, 20 degrees of elevation and come back down. So I'm going to bring you up through here. Just kind of relax yourself. Anytime that we're looking at flexion, 
we're also looking at the ability to stabilize through the shoulder blade. So scapulohumeral rhythm is something that happens when this joint moves up as the humerus elevates this way. We should also have some rotation happening at the scap. Scapulohumeral rhythm means that after we hit about 90 degrees here, for every two degrees of range of motion that happen into the elevation plane, we have one degree of range of motion that's happening in the scapular rotation. While we're here, I'm just going to go through looking at some passive rotations, external, internal. And the difference there is, we we're testing up here, Dave's got his shoulder on his ear here, and he's getting yeah, 80 degrees, that looks pretty good. Again, we get the shoulder down where anatomically it's neutral, and we're getting about 50 degrees. Again, those compensation patterns hitting. Let's look at this opposite side. Again, we're not in the business of cranking something that we already know has bone chips in it, but we do want to get a pretty good idea of where this is at. So just try to relax everything. We're just going to passively be using some oscillations to try to open Dave up a tiny bit. So this is another one of those. It's just muscularly guarded. It's co-contracting. It's neurologically locked. The neural lock mechanism is highly on this shoulder. So internal rotation, external rotation, highly limited. Elevation, highly limited. Testing from 90, 90 degree position. Limited and painful. Front side shoulder when I get there. Where? Um, right in the middle. Right in the middle of the shoulder? In the, yeah, in the joint deep. In the joint deep. And then look in. So this thing is pretty locked up. So we're looking at minimal degrees of external, minimal degrees of internal, inability to elevate more than about 60 or 70 degrees. We knew that we were dealing with this. Yeah. But the interesting thing about it is that if we can stabilize this better and we can move a little bit more efficiently, five degrees here, that's going to be a game changer yeah, for yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Absolute yeah. game changer. So going from like, like what you say, shit the suck, mm -hmm. that's going to be a game changer. So if you look at something like this, you don't give up on stuff like that. You don't pound through and do mindless mobility work either. Mm -hmm. What we do is find out what we need to do to get those couple degrees that are going to allow you to do what you want to do long term without keeping out of the surgical table. Yeah. So we're going to have you go up into a Y position next. So I want you to come up and you're going to be coming up into this position. More so what I'm looking at here, come up all the way if you can on that left side. Good, come back down. Bring both up at once. What I'm looking at here is the scaps, the lats, and their ability to stabilize against the table here. Good, and come back down. Do this one independently, so just go. And again, unilaterally, great range of motion here. The lat sitting, the scap sitting. I'm comfortable with that range of motion. The last one is you're going to flip your thumbs. They're going to be pointed upwards, and we're going to do doing a snow angel up. Okay, and come back down. Go up again. Good, come back down. Good. All right, so we got a pretty complete view of the shoulder between the FMS testing, looking at functional internal, external. We just look at joint isolation and deflection, scaption, abduction, internal, external rotation. The only thing that we're looking at is extension last. So if we can come up, sit at the edge of the table here, we're just going to quickly look at your extension moment. So with your thumbs facing forward, I'm just going to take you back into this position. Good. Neck and neutral. Okay. Extension is not that bad. How'd that feel? That's not bad. Not bad? Good. All right. So complete history at the shoulder. A lot of shit going on. Mm -hmm. Movement wise, looking pretty good over here. A little bit restricted into rotation. Your elevation plane is good. Your ability to move the scaps on this side is pretty good as well. We're pretty much globally locked up on this right side. But here's the key. 
if we just try to crank the glenohumeral joint over and over again, you only have so many bullets in the chamber, so to yes. say. You have so many bullets in the chamber, but we can keep this in a neutral position and we can work the shit out of this. We can get this working better because the better we can get this working, the better this is going to feel. Yeah. Gotcha. So it's working about on origins instead of symptoms. We have yeah. some origins over here, but again, we have some low hanging fruit back here. Mm -hmm. You know, the biggest thing is with scapulohumeral rhythm and scapular stability is being able to have immense amounts of scapular control, dynamic control, so we can take the pressure off a pain point that we know that it exists yeah. already. That's gonna, be, that's gonna be a big thing for us. Um, mobilizing T-spine, being able to reintegrate the scap with really sparing the shoulder in the process and allowing you to continue to press meaningfully. Yeah. Because extension you got. Yeah, Extension's yeah. there. Your flexion's there to an extent through the range of motion that you need. Yeah. Again, just unlocking a little bit more will happen without ever doing anything here. This will be a beneficiary of improving this. Yeah. And again, it's not always where it hurts. It's a big point. Yeah, I mean, the, one of the things that issues I've had with the shoulder is if I am training, say, a side raise or a seated side raise, yep. I have to be extremely conscious of my trap. Yep. Because my trap wants to do it, which means they're all very short small ranges yep. of motions or john's whatever he calls the <laughs> destroyer swings, set yeah. the swings or whatever it is that's all i can do because anything more trap yep. so there's very little shoulder activation do you ever do band pull aparts oh yeah yeah just setting up with a band in front of your yeah, chest i gotta walk here you know I, I'll, I'll do them lying standing i do them all the fucking time okay cool so it's in face pulls trap really lit up yeah. on face pulls um if I use uh, the blast straps or TRX straps, I'm yep. far better at it because I can control and stay out of a pain range of motion. If I'm using a cable or a strap, mm -hmm. you're kind of stuck okay. to only a few planes that you can hit. Gotcha. And that, I can't get my grip apart enough to make it pain free. Right, okay. Right, I can, but I can't get back far enough. That's okay. what I'm trying okay. to say. I want to test one more thing. Um, we're gonna spare all the muscle testing and shit just because it's like mundane. Um, we know what we're dealing with. In terms of, uh, I'm gonna test two things off camera, but lats, hamstrings, eccentric loading on those things, the ability to create force, maintain position. Those are gonna be the two things I really wanna test because mm -hmm. I have a hinkering that that's what we're gonna get into. Um, in terms of the pull apart positions, there's a specific pull apart that I've been teaching. Um, it's really good in order to engage the lap in order to authenticate the upper back working and it takes the traps right out of it. So that's one that we're definitely going to add to the target later on this afternoon and mm -hmm. teach that one. Uh, it's one of the more powerful, simple things that we've used. Um, the last thing I want to go over is balance assessment. Mm -hmm. This makes you feel like an asshole. So just prefacing it by getting you up into these positions, having your eyes closed, doing that kind of stuff. Gotcha. We're gonna get you into these positions. I'm gonna be standing right next to you. And basically we're gonna to try to get you to lose your balance. We're gonna see where your breaking point is. More so we're gonna talk about where the compensation patterns hit. We've had compensation patterns throughout the afternoon in many different positions. We want again to see them up against motor control. We wanna look at some asymmetrical loading and kind of see where the weakest link is so we can start improving that one key thing so we can let the dominoes kind of hit each other and get on a row. Yeah. So let's come up into a standing position and you're gonna be right where I am. You're gonna be standing in anatomical neutral and we're gonna chill there for 10 seconds. I used to joke that if you can't stand for 10 seconds with your eyes open like this, that you got kicked out. Yeah. But then we had one dude like two years ago that can't couldn't stand like this and I didn't kick him out. So we don't <laughs> joke around like that anymore. Good, relax the arms down to the side. And then from this position, you're gonna go eyes closed. So anytime that we're doing a balance assessment, it's really important that I'm here because you never know when shit's gonna hit the fan and balance is lost. Because again, we're trying to test to see where the weakest link is in the stability chain. Good, open up your eyes from here. Before we get into it, we're assessing for three different kind of compensation patterns. We have an ankle and foot stability pattern, which is what we kind of want. We want this ground contact to be where we're having the agility from. We're also looking 
if there's anything happening at the hip stability moment or at a torso stability moment. So the kind of patterns that you have are gonna determine kind of where your weakest link is with this stuff. So we're gonna come into a single leg stance first. You're gonna be right in this position, 90-90, and you're gonna be maintaining that for 10 seconds. Awesome, good job. There's something about this test that makes everyone smile. It's like, oh yeah. shit, I know what I'm getting into Something now. Happened. Let's look at the opposite side here. Good and relax. So the key here is not to be like, holy shit, you moved a little bit. That's not the point. It's to get you to move a little bit, to mm -hmm. get you to compensate and see where the compensation is happening from. So on the opposite side, it was supination, pronation, supination, pronation, all happening at the ankle. Hip was nice and locked in. Lumbar spine was locked in. Core unit was locked mm -hmm. in. This opposite side that we just tested, you know, you had some supination, pronation happening. And it wasn't as fine tuned. So the stability component went up chain. Mm -hmm. It went to the hip and the hip was like, uh-uh, I'm not having yeah. it. Then you started going right over at the... Yeah. at the torso here. So we're going to add some complexity to this testing and we're going to do these positions again with your eyes closed. So the way that I want you to do this is I want you to get into position. Once you're in the position, I want the eyes closed once you're in the position. That was perfect. Okay, relax for a second. What kind of stability pattern was that? Torso, right. the torso. <laughs> Straight yeah. down. So we, we kind of saw it start with the foot. Mm -hmm. Foot falls deep into supination, goes right up chain. The torso was the missing link. And this didn't stabilize, this didn't stabilize, this didn't stabilize, you fall over. Let's go and test that again. Again, I'm kind of keeping a track in my mind here. Good and relax. So that was interesting too, because we compensated to the opposite side that time. Pronation failed you on that one hip abduction failed you come in this way about two to three seconds let's go one more time here good okay cool so this is what we want to look at most people they're going to fail around their hips um, in some cases they fail at the torso but usually that's coming from the hips and many times we just want the stability pattern to be at the foot at any cost so let's go to the opposite side here Look, reset everything, kind of take a deep breath. Good. So this is interesting on this side. It's like there's, it's not like you're trying to do this, but there's like no effort. It's yeah. like, nope, I'm just going down. It's not even like there's a fighting chance to stabilize through the hip. It's just your momentum bringing you straight down with the asymmetrical yeah. loading. Go one more time for me. So there's literally no stabilization happening no. from this lateral hip right now. A little bit happening from the ankles we saw, okay, but this is the key component. This is a weak link right now, forcing the torso to do something that it's not able to do. Mm -hmm. So we saw some decent stability at the ankles. So now we need to differentiate like, are we working on the ankles or are we working on the hips? Like a smart man would say like, we have two fucking bilateral hip replacements, we're yeah. working on the hips. But in order to just cover all our bases, we're gonna get you down into a half kneeling position. We're gonna test again. So we're gonna use this AirX pad. We're gonna position you where you're gonna be kneeling. Your toes are gonna to be in on the backside. You're gonna have your heel in front of this hip, 90 degrees, 90 degrees, and you're gonna be in a vertical torso position. Good. So we're gonna stay here for about 10 seconds, eyes open. Goes flip on the opposite side. So you're gonna come right in front of the hip. So you can go right in front of my foot here, good. Go toes in on the back side. Good, we're gonna flip over to the opposite side again. So we're in a hip neutral 
position here. So this is probably the most advantageous position to actually gain force and stability from in terms of asymmetrical stance in a half kneeling position. From this position, you can go eyes closed and we're going to monitor. Good job. Eyes open again with flip sides. And then eyes closed. It's important to note here that we are testing the side that is down, not the side that's out front. You can see the lean starting to happen here. Good, relax. So guys, when we're in this half kneeling position, this is the side that we're testing. This is the hip that's in ground contact and it's in a neutral position and it really has a lot of this lateral hip group which is going to be the requisite for stability. We're going to switch one more time here and what we're going to do is we're going to narrow up your base. So we were right in front of the hip. I want you to get this heel in front of the back knee. So you're going to inch your way over into a narrow base supported position. Again, 90 degrees here, 90 degrees here. Guys, we're testing this, but we're also looking at compensations. We're finding the weakest link and we're identifying it. Good, relax. Let's go opposite side. We're going to go to that narrow base, inching the heel in front of the back knee. Toes in on the back side. A little bit more stable over here. I feel like you have some confidence in the stability over here. Let's switch one more time and the most advanced uh, half kneeling is narrow stance, eyes closed. So you're going to get into that position. Once you're in the position, you're going to go eyes closed. Good. Let's go opposite way. So again, seeing that same hip stability pattern, that's the one that's not stabilizing, it's causing the torso to go over and lose, lose balance. I know you're surprising yourself right now with this one. You're like, fuck yes. Good, relax. Wait, so what adductor was it again that you were having trouble with? Hmm. Adductor gets no fucking credit for being the primary stabilizer of single leg stance. Primary stabilizer. If you look at a cross-sectional area of the upper leg, so say you cut the leg right like this, you got the quads that are like this thick, you got hamstrings that are a little bit thicker, then you got the adductor group. Adductor group comes, comes down across the knee, it comes into the medial side of the femur, it goes up into the pelvis. There's seven different muscles. These things are strong as hell and they stabilize and they create huge amounts of force. When we have chronic problems there, usually it comes with an inhibition of the activation on the lateral side of the hip. If you kind of cut the body in half, you have medial and lateral side. If we, don't, if we have deficits here, unable to stabilize here, we have to try to pick up stability from the opposite side. When this overworks, it gets tired and gets weak. So we get chronic tightness, weakness that happen globally there. And I see this on the right side more than anything, but we actually quantified it right here because you fell within three seconds, narrow base, eyes closed. And that's something that I guarantee when we actually get this to work, we strengthen this a tiny bit, you can be sitting there for 30 seconds straight. Mm -hmm. That was really good. That's the key thing that we found here. So we found the red flag. We had it in our subjective history. We saw it in the split stance. We quantified it here on the table in terms of range of motion, uh, differentiating motor control from soft tissue, and then we got it functional stability here, and we quantified it with three seconds, narrow stance, eyes closed, and that's our baseline st uh, starting point. So that's going to be something that, again, we test and retest when we get into programming. Cool. That opposite side was, that was shocking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can see you being like, yeah, I like, can't Before, believe I did that. By that last, that second last rep, we could really see some moving parts that weren't present on the first, second, and third reps. 
So that's all stuff that, again, on an assessment standpoint, yeah, we're gonna compensate, we're gonna hit compensation when we're training hard and training heavy, but we wanna know what's the first compensating thing that hits. 